it looks like everyone is sort of connecting to audio and we are um, getting settled. So I want to thank you all for attending our Syracuse University School of Architecture lecture this evening. Our lecturer is Sean Alquist, and I've just learned that he's actually a former native of Syracuse. Um, <laughs> He didn't go to Syracuse University, but he did live in Liverpool growing up. So it's a kind of welcome home in the most virtual of ways. Um, Sean's an associate professor of architecture at the University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. He's part of the Computational Media and Interactive Systems Cluster, which connects architecture with the fields of material science, computer science, art, and design, and music. In 2011, he published Computational Design Thinking, which was co-edited with Occam Mingus. His research uses a large scale industrial CNC knitting machine, which is part of the Fab Lab. And in particular, his research explores and develops new technologies in highly articulated textile and composite materials. So thank you, Sean, for joining us. And we look forward to your lecture. With this, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, oh, because I disabled uh, screen sharing. I think you should be able to check. join now. Got it. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. I'm excited to uh, virtually <laughs> uh, visit um, Syracuse again. Um, it's been a little while since I've been there. Um, so thanks for the introduction and the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> So I do want to give um, just one uh, additional tidbit of background. Um, so um, I'm a professor of architecture at, at Michigan, and um, I don't particularly practice architecture. <laughs> um, I focus a bit more on research, which is a little bit um, uh, uh, material research, which is a little bit unique in the field of architecture. Um, but it gives me a unique opportunity to really um, to explore architecture from a few different avenues and do it in somewhat of a non-committal way. Um, so I have the opportunity to really prototype ideas, um, to test them, test them on short term, see what works, see what doesn't work, and then retest them and redo it and try a new context and, and try a new place and try interact with new people. Um, so you'll very much see how that plays out through the presentation, but I just think it's important um, for people to understand that um, I don't do this work kind of in the normal sort of setting of practice. It is more of a kind of academic and, and research venture. So, um, as I said, I uh, focus on architecture. And I wanted to talk to really center or, or at least start from the point of um, figuring out uh, how it possibly gets it wrong and maybe does so often, um, but maybe it's okay, um, maybe that it should, uh, maybe it's okay that it can get it wrong um, to a certain degree. Uh, I, I want to address this in the context of um, disability, of diversity, of inclusion. Um, so in that sense, to get it wrong, you're kind of admitting that you didn't know, you guessed wrong. Um, but you also didn't try for a sort of false empathy um, that says like, well, I thought I could walk a mile in someone's shoes and, and know how to make the right, the right decision. So in that case, getting it wrong is, is actually maybe the right thing to do. So then you have to be willing, can it be corrected? And then if it can be corrected, can we allow it to be done by someone else? And for me, the, the point of that someone else is that it's someone like this little girl. So this is my daughter. Um, her name is Ada, uh, spelled A-R-A, -A, but we pronounce it Ada. Um, <clears throat> she has autism spectrum disorder. Um, autism, just, just to get real quick background, um, autism is a potentially severe neurological condition. Um, it affects um, social function, it affects communication, um, and also affects uh, behavior, um, social and, um, and emotional behavior. It's called a spectrum disorder um, because the symptoms and characteristics um, can present themselves in a variety of ways. 
Um, there's a doctor who coined the phrase, when you've met someone with autism, you've met that one person with autism. So in particular with Ada, um, she's nonverbal, um, but she's very much a communicator. So neurologically, there are some things going on that inhibits the sort of signaling and muscular control that allows that that would allow her to shape sounds into words and sentences and have conversations. But by other means, and you can almost see it, how she's communicating in this picture, by other means, she is tirelessly and expressively communicating with us. Um, there's a, a wonderful um, self-advocate for autism. Her name is Carly Fleischman. Um, she, in a book that she wrote with her father, um, she says that, and, and she's nonverbal, she says, in a world of silence, communication is everywhere. You just need to know where to look. So this means for Ada that I am the necessary participant in this search for meaning from whatever is the everywhere, a suitcase, a pile of bubbles, whatever it might be. <clears throat> so what interests me is um, really this moment this moment for how communication occurs through some sort of what I would definitely call architectural, spatial, temporal, experiential medium. So through the suitcase, there is a means of communication. Um, and, and to me, that, that exploration of, of how new forms of communication emerge in such ad hoc and ingenious ways, I think is very interesting and very important um, to understanding not only how I communicate with my daughter, but how I communicate with others who would have a very um, different way of functioning in the world. So um, this was kind of the, the softer version of the title uh, for the lecture, the orchid, the dandelion, and the slide. Um, so what I want to talk about here is um, exactly how architecture can play a part in certainly getting it wrong, but also how it can become the utility for um, creating something right. So if we look at the slide, um, you know, the slide is something obviously incredibly ubiquitous um, on the playground. And my daughter has always enjoyed the slide. Um, she has, she, she kind of fits herself within a, a category called um, sensory seeking. Um, so that means for her, very strong sensations are actually quite soothing and engaging. Um, so obviously something like the slide is quite exciting to her. What became really interesting were these moments when we'd go to the playground and um, she'd be using the slide, she'd climb up, but she actually wouldn't come back down. So we started to uh, correlate this a little bit and we'd noticed that sure enough, we had just maybe said like, okay, we got five minutes and then we got to leave the playground and go home. So these were the moments that she would then, you know, suspend herself at the top of the slide and not want to go down. Um, so what we started to put together was, of course, she can't tell us, no, I don't want to go. She could maybe run to the far corners of the playground, but you know, we would actually be able to chase her there. So she found the one point that she would actually see is the most distant point on the playground. I'm not going to chase her up the slide and somehow figure out how to drag her down. So she found this, you know, kind of beacon on the playground, this point that we couldn't reach her. And then through that position, obviously with the tongue wagging and the face that she's making, it's clear that she's communicating through these, these kind of combination of very multimodal things. She's communicating, no, I don't want to go. <clears throat> So it's actually a really valuable moment. And, and for me, kind of very exciting to see like how she can take something and kind of turn it on its head and turn it into something incredibly useful for her in ways that like, you know, we just wouldn't think of. So the problem is there's kind of an issue with 
what I would call the sort of fixity, um, the kind of permanence of the meaning of this thing, right? So, so we're on the playground. Obviously, the playground usually contains other children. There are all these activities where over time, it's very clear how you're supposed to operate on these different armatures, these different with, within these different activities, right? Even just looking at the slide, it's very clear there's a ladder. So you know that's the side that you're gonna climb down. There's a, a smooth part, you know that's the part you're supposed to slide down. Well, Ada has put all of that to a halt, right? So now she's standing at the top of the, the slide and she needs it as a part of, you know, to kind of become a part of her vocabulary <clears throat> to talk with me. <clears throat> but it also means that all the other kids that want to go up that slide, well, they can't do it, right? They're being held up. So now Ada is this bratty child that is ignoring everyone around her and preventing them from getting their turn on the slide. And then I'm, of course, the entitled parent that is allowing, sort of celebrating, that this child is, you know, just standing there and gesturing to me and communicating. Um, so it actually becomes a very um, oppressive environment. Maybe that's a little bit harsh, but it becomes an environment where we feel like we just don't fit. Um, so, so what happens in response? So what this means for us is we, you know, go to the playground by ourselves. We have fun. And of course, there's a value in figuring out these ways, this sort of shared form of communication through the objects in Ada's world. Um, but the problem is, uh, you know, we have to do it without any other children around. Um, so, you know, it's kind of this, this sort of, this thing that, that comes up with, um, you know, disability and, and, and difference and, and when you don't fit into the norm, you're sort of allowed to get a certain amount and, 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 but not everything, right? So she gets the activity on the playground, she gets to use the playground, that's not restricted to her, but she doesn't also to, um, get that social experience, right? And that is like one of the most fundamental parts of the playground is it's the opportunity to develop social skills, right? To learn how to be a social actor amongst your peers, how to practice, how to test things, how to master things. Well, she gets none of that. She gets the physical activity, she gets some social interaction with us, but that's it. She doesn't get the entirety um, of that situation. <clears throat> so that's us, you know, all alone on the playground. <clears throat> So inclusion, I think it's, um, you know, a, a word that often doesn't quite get enough um, clarity in terms of a definition. So I'm going to um, talk about uh, some of the writings by Tobin Siebers, and I would highly recommend um, reading his book, um, Disability Theory. Um, it's quite an amazing and eye-opening read and actually speaks a lot to, um, you know, physical architectural circumstances as well. Um, so, you know, there's often um, this distinction that you can find in terms of inclusion, and it really circles around this idea of welcoming. Um, so, you know, as, as Tobin Siebers um, says, um, you know, the social body is standard, um, invisible, only until we welcome that non-standard body um, into that space. There's another author, Sarah Ahmed, who studies diversity and racism, and, and sees that welcoming and points out really clearly when you're making that effort to welcome, when you think inclusion is about welcoming, well, all it's doing is implicating that one party, that non-standard non body as being the one not at home. So that kind of inequality, that, um, that sort of hierarchy, um, I think that's, you know, again, kind of where architecture gets it wrong. <clears throat> so, how do we start to think about it in ways where maybe it can um, get it right, and how do we kind of learn from that moment with Ada where, um, you know, experience, activity, and objects become a part of language? Architecture becomes a part of language. So, one thing that's been really helpful is, it's, um, you know, the 
elaborate title is at the top, but um, it's really a model for um, environmental susceptibility. So what it's saying is that it's really kind of offering two categories. So one is the resilient individual you might see as yourself or as the sort of norm, um, where no matter the um, no matter the environment, um, except in maybe the worst cases, no matter the environment, you're able to maintain a particular outcome. You're able to maintain a successful outcome. Um, so you don't necessarily have vulnerability, but you also don't get a kind of you know enhancement um, through any kind of um, more positive environmental stimuli. Well, somebody with autism might uh, uh, ride the more dramatic line where in circumstances where there's a kind of um, you know negative environment. So for instance, on the slide where um, Ada's peers are getting upset with her because she's not going down the slide and they're getting confused um, with why she won't do that. So in that negative environment, her capacity to be social, her capacity to be resilient to that situation, her capacity to um, withstand um, that kind of negative stimulation, um, she becomes very vulnerable to it and it affects her ability to have a successful behavioral emotional response. And often this is where we position people with disability, this kind of like deficit um, orientation, where are they the weakest and how do we address that? The thing that gets lost is the other end of that line. So, and there's actually been studies that have looked at that, looked at this. So for somebody who is essentially keenly aware of their environment, if that environment is supportive, if it hits the right dials, if it's set to the right settings, which could be really intense, it could be really mute, there actually is the capacity for, for exceptionality, for exceptional outcomes. Um, and like I said, in studies, they've shown that this person that rides this line can actually outdo, outperform, um, have a more exceptional outcome than what is defined as the resilient um, uh, individual. So, um, and this is where the, the kind of title of the section comes in. The flat line is considered the dandelion that can live in just about any environment. And the line that represents um, the autistic individual um, is the orchid, um, the one who is very um, contingent upon their environment. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is shift that a little bit and look at it from more of a social context. And again, in the, in, through the experiences with my daughter, um, and also think more about, you know, the meaning of, of space in this diagram, the meaning of environment as, as not being um, immutable, but something that can be malleable. So again, we're, you know, we see the kind of idea of the sort of exclusionary space on the left, right? So the moment at which um, the, the kind of hyper aware, the orchid um, is in discord with their environment. Um, again, what I want to look to is the right hand side where we have contribution, but I also want to look at the fact that instead of thinking of this as one individual writing one line and another individual writing another line, it really should be a definition of a certain moment in time. So, for instance, I think we can all maybe um, understand this a little bit more. If you might uh, typically define yourself as the dandelion, the resilient person, we've all been put into um, very new environmental circumstances <laughs> by having to work from our apartments, by limiting the number of social venues that we can attend, limiting those social venues in terms of the number of people that we can experience with it. And we're, we're not very in sync with how these operate. Therefore, we don't feel very comfortable. Therefore, we don't feel that we can perform to our highest potential. I don't know how many people think they can perform to their highest potential after sitting on Zoom for five hours straight. Um, so it's actually that it's really more situational, right? You may think of yourself as resilient, but because of the foreignness of the context, you actually flip to becoming an orchid. You're now more aware of your environment. And I think the, also the other thing to be uh, to consider is 
you're more aware that this environment is very immutable. You don't have the variables, you don't have the bells and whistles, the capability to transform it into something that does operate in a more um, comfortable way, right? I mean, your, your bedroom is built for, for sleeping, your living room is built for, you know, watching TV um, or sitting and reading a book. Um, it doesn't have, in most cases, the ability to be shifted into something that's comfortable for a workspace when you're sitting on a screen. So this is where I think like it's important to consider that um, uh, environment is more influential than you might think, even if you are the, the resilient person, and that also there should be a social consideration. So the fact that when my daughter is highly functional, such as on the slide, and she's communicating with me, that now makes me more hyper aware of the environment. So I'm no longer resilient. We're as a collective more the kind of orchids because we're using the environment as a medium to communicate through. Um, so I think it's so in the work that we do, we try to that I've been doing, we try to um, think in, in situation as opposed to characterization of the individual, situation and a social collective as opposed to um, the, the kind of individuality of each person. <clears throat> so this starts to get a little bit um, elaborate, but I think I can explain this um, well with the, if you remember the example with the suitcase. <laughs> so how do we think about these moments where we um, utilize environment as a transformative tool um, and use it to spur communication, use it to spur a shared form of communication that is maybe some, that is something um, uh, unique to an, an a, a kind of certain social um, interaction. Um, so obviously with my daughter, she's nonverbal, so it's very much about always developing novel forms of communication. But I think when communicating with anybody that has a different background from you, um, you're, you're making something new when you figure out the uh, a kind of fluid way to interact with each other. So on the right is this kind of iterative model for um, what's called collaborative or shared play. Um, and I just want to point out the key steps. So number one, um, we and, and this is a, a, a tool um, that we used with my daughter to help develop um, uh, trust in communication, let's say. So one, uh, step one, the activity um, follow the lead, follows the lead of my daughter. So she has selected in this case that, you know, she wants to be zipped inside the suitcase. We, we did not voluntarily zip her into the suitcase. Um, that was very much on her own. <laughs> Um, accord to do that. <clears throat> so she's kind of chosen that as the, the sort of, you know, sensory rich activity um, to be uh, uh, a part to, to, to use as the centerpiece for this. So now I'm a part of this because in this activity, she also wants to be moved around in the suitcase. Um, so it's not just sitting inside it, she wants to be <laughs> rolled around the, the whole house. So the key moment is that while we're rolling around the house, I pause that activity <clears throat> and during that pause, I wait for her to reply back to me using any form of communication to indicate that she wants to keep this activity going again. So in this case, as you see in that little picture, all it is, is eye contact. Eye contact is obviously communication, pointing is communication and utterance is communication. The second she gives that communication, then the activity um, immediately goes forward. So it's both an activation of the, of the activity because that is quite, you know, sensorily uh, engaging to her, but it's also an immediate conversation, uh, confirmation that that form of communication is valuable, that she knows that it means something to me and I understand the meaning of that form of, of communication in this context. So we've completed what's called a, a circle of communication. She opens it with the activity. I um, initiate it further with the pause and waiting for her interaction. And then we close it by continuing that activity. And then what's really key is this sort of alteration of the activity. So instead of repeating that over and over and over, 
we want to try and generalize these tools for communication so that it's not just fixed. Eye contact only means suitcase go forward. <laughs> Obviously, we need eye contact to mean many more things than that. So, you know, uh, um, stopping the suitcase, rolling the suitcase over the carpet, rolling it outdoors, going in circles, going left, going right. All these things can become alterations to that activity so that it doesn't become um, fixed in just a, a very concise um, and, and inextensible um, forms of language. So now the question of um, how, how do we try, um, how, at least how in my research, um, do we try to um, address this challenge of architecture becoming communication? So I think this really uh, kind of lays out one of the, the fundamental um, challenges to the research and, and fundamental in the sense that it's absolutely critical that we abide by this, but it's not always in keeping with how we operate as designers and architects. So the idea that uh, one environment kind of materializes ability, um, I think that's very important, but then two, the fact that ability is this kind of situational emergent phenomenon that is unpredictable and unknown. I will never, ever, ever know what it's like for my daughter to have autism. I will not know what it's like for her to be nonverbal. I will not know what it's like for her in, in, in her sensory experience um, of environment. And I don't think I deserve to know either. Um, that is her world view, um, and, you know, I shouldn't think I'm privileged to, to know what that is. She can share with me as much as she can, and we can try to figure out ways to communicate that, but it's essentially always going to be unknowable, and um, it's unfortunately for me as a parent always going to be often quite unpredictable um, as well. <clears throat> So the way that I try to um, address this, of course, since it has so much to do with not only um, the issue of kind of neurodiversity um, related to autism, but human behavior um, and so on, um, the, the research really happens by trying to um, interconnect these three dots. Um, so I live in the bubble of material research, uh, but then also collaborate um, with the areas um, related to neurodiversity um, and human behavior, and that kind of plays out um, along these lines. So at one point or another, I've collaborated with people across these um, different um, disciplines, you know, whether it's Ada herself <laughs> as a collaborator um, or working with um, educators, working with people in behavior science, um, speech and language therapists, um, a lot of the work I've done with kinesiologists has been um, quite opening, and I'll touch upon that um, in a couple points, as well as maybe some of the more conventional of working with structural engineers, um, working with computer scientists, um, and so on. <clears throat> so as uh, Amber had mentioned, um, one of the centerpieces of the work is this um, fun little device here. Um, so this is a um, large-scale industrial knitting machine. Um, actually, I have two of them in my lab um, at the University of Michigan. We love we love fabrication machines and robots and milling machines and stuff at at Michigan. So it was a great opportunity to convince the school to buy uh, one of these and get get a second one along the way too. Um, <clears throat> so knitting in itself, um, this kind of captures what it's often most often used for. Um, so it largely in the fashion industry, so uh, you, uh, to make um, something like a sweater, to do stockings, and then if any, at this point, it's more than just Nike, but the first was the Nike fly knit shoes, where the entire upper of the shoe was, was one single knitted piece. Um, so it's interesting to work in this space where there are these very concrete uses of this device. But if you do kind of generalize what you're looking at, um, it, it really has a, a quite exciting potential. So the sweater is a really complex geometry. There's lots of variation and form. Um, it's volumetric, um, but also has this kind of, you know, T sort of Y condition. Um, so that 
sort of interconnection of volumes is really interesting architecturally. Obviously, the stocking has quite a degree of texture to it and depth. Um, so, you know, the textile isn't just this kind of single membrane. It's a membrane where you can play with depth. And then the, the, the shoe example is kind of about performativity, right? So the idea within one material, you can specify not only color, but differentiation and structure, right? Like the heel has to be very stiff. The arch area has to be very porous for to kind of allow air to move in and out. Um, the toe, again, has to have a certain kind of stiffness, yes, yet also give to it. So that ability to kind of like change the structural properties within one seamless material, obviously that's, that's very, has, has quite architectural relevance to it. But I want to touch upon why knitting is so fundamentally different from the way that we often operate um, with, with architecture. And again, <clears throat> at Taubman College, you've maybe seen the pictures of the robots. It's all about the machines. <laughs> Um, it's all about doing digital fabrication, um, but I do think digital fabrication in the area of knitting really does sit in a different line than a lot of these other um, uh, um, modes of fabrication. And I think the first thing is that, you know, so uh, let's just take the example of the textile. So if you're not knitting a textile yourself, well, you're getting a piece of material off a shelf, right? You're getting a material that has already been manufactured. So therefore, the first thing you're going to do is to start to almost remanufacture it or post-manufacture it into something exactly that you want. So you're taking this standardized thing and trying to make it into something non-standardized. <clears throat> now, of course, along with that, comes the pain of doing so. So you've taken this kind of, you know, very uniform sheet and made it very non-uniform, cut it up into a bunch of pieces, which then means if it's a textile, you don't have to sew all those pieces together um, to make something out of it. So this was early work that I did when I was um, doing uh, research um, in Stuttgart, uh, Germany at the Institute for Computational Design, the ICD. Um, so, you know, we can certainly do exciting things with it. And, and you know, this was a, a, a very important um, piece in the, in the progress of my research. <laughs> but it was pointed out to me by a colleague. He just couldn't shake the fact that it looked like underwear. So we were using this spandex material and he just couldn't not see it for the spandex material. <laughs> But I think that's incredibly telling. And this is where the line becomes really drawn between using this kind of pre-manufactured material um, and almost how it relates to the slide. So that pre-manufactured material, it carries that baggage for the context of where somebody might have seen that before, right? It carries a certain history. It carries a certain, um, you know, representation, a certain use. Um, if you try to break that use, it can be very hard to abandon that baggage. Just like the slide is, is almost impossible to abandon its use for the sliding activity instead of just this beacon to kind of stand, you know, 20 feet off the ground. Um, it's not a tower, right? But that's how Otto was using it as a tower. If it were only a tower or if it were something more amorphous, then she would have a better chance to communicate herself without the interference of that backstory of the slide. So for us, the idea is we are manufacturing that material from its first instances. And this may sound insane, but we actually do look at yarns at this scale and design them at this scale. <laughs> so this is often one of the types of yarns that we use. It's called nylastic because it has a, um, an elastic core, like a lycra core. Um, so that this kind of um, thicker vertical, this thicker line here, that's a, a single elastic uh, uh, filament. And then it's wrapped by nylon. Um, so the number of nylon pieces and the uh, filaments and the wrapping helps us define like the bulk and performance of that yarn. How thin is it? How fat is it? How much does it stretch? How much is it constrained? Um, we do design from this point. 
Um, it is insane. And like I say, like this is um, incredibly um, exciting, but also extremely daunting to be able to use this as a starting point for design. And then we just build up from there. How does this yarn or maybe one yarn with com combined with another yarn, how does that become stitches? Um, how do those stitches, are they then built into a textile? And then how does that textile perform as this kind of tensile interface, as this tensile structure, as this, um, you know, formal architecture? <clears throat> so this is really my domain. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a parent to my daughter, so that's how I learn about kind of, you know, her version of environment. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, an architecture professor um, who has a knitting machine um, and researchers that help us work on it. Um, so in that realm, this is, you know, the, the, the scope that I work with. So having access to a yarn twisting machine designing from that point all the way up to the structure of the yarn and of course linking that linking all these different steps in terms of methods of being able to design something and then being able to produce um, the code that runs the machine that's you know very much a part of our um, process as well um, usually we start with we call these sort of building blocks um, these sort of small studies which allow us to um, understand the logic of a material and a stitch structure. Um, you know, so you can see on the left, it's very much about the kind of volumetric forms that we can generate. On the right, it's about um, volume and, and differing the, um, the, the kind of stiffness um, within a single continuous surface. So the one thing about knitting is all of these are, are all made as a single piece off the machine. So there's no cutting and sewing, none of that stuff. You know, we don't touch sewing machines. We don't have scissors. Scissors don't work well with, with knitted um, fabrics. If you've ever tried to do that to your sweater, it falls apart uh, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so looking at form, looking at how to integrate um, different material properties within one seamless system. And then, of course, once we understand that logic, then we try to look at it at, you know, the scale of architecture, which is, is a very novel use of these knitting machines. There, I mean, there's really only two others um, in two, maybe three um, others in the world that, that use these machines um, at the scale um, of architecture. Um, so that's where we really start to dig into to new territory of thinking how we do that. <clears throat> there's always a funny moment when we talk to people in the industry, um, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if we, we can quite be interactive enough, but I'd be curious, uh, yeah, we'll come back to it. So be curious what people think, how long it takes to, to knit um, these textiles. Um, it's, yeah, we always get kind of a, a different response um, in terms of who's shocked by how long it takes to make this stuff. So we can revisit that at the, at the end. Okay, so now how do we um, really think about uh, um, designing with this material? And then, of course, how does, you know, as we've been saying, how does it become this um, sort of agency for communication, agency for um, diverse forms of communication? So, um, <clears throat> actually, I'll stay at that one slide. So, there's a term here um, called requisite uh, variety, um, and that's, it's actually called from from cybernetics, um, so uh, you know, which not all of cybernetics is is valuable in this context, but um, from cybernetics, it's it's really about the idea of a design space. Um, so requisite variety essentially means um, how much variety in a system do you have to deal with what variety of environmental circumstances. Um, so obviously you can be very discreet about that. Something like a thermostat um, is a very clear example of requisite variety. Um, you know, the most traditional thermostat is a bimetal strip that, you know, curls or uncurls based on its ambient environment. So the relationship of those materials is designed um, to a requisite variety of the range of temperatures that it needs to measure. Now, of course, in this case, requisite variety is an unknown. Um, so therefore, um, being able to um, uh, understand the scope of what is needed in terms of requis requisite variety becomes, um, becomes a challenge. 
So <clears throat> now kind of talking about um, the really the kind of transformation in how this uh, this idea of using the knitted material as a kind of key medium in this work. So, um, you know, this, this kind of lays out the more traditional realm of, of what, you know, computational design and digital fabrication is, right? The very top left is a um, digital model, um, a simulation model from the software that I wrote in processing ages ago. Um, so we take that model, we then have to translate that into information so that we can um, uh, then um, uh, uh, fabricate the material. Um, so, you know, studying different material samples, in this case, doing this kind of um, ribbed textile and varying the, the kind of branching of the ribbed system um, as a way to deal with non-planar surfaces, essentially. Um, so, you know, you sort of have more material on one side than another. Um, and then, of course, doing a prototype to confirm, you know, that whole process, um, going from the model, how much um, kind of alignment is there to the final prototype. The thing that I found very peculiar when we did this was, you know, in all these samples that I was making, the very intimate experience in terms of, you know, watching it be made on the knitting machine stitch by stitch, um, feeling it when it comes out of the machine, stretching it, stretching it in different ways, seeing its translucency, seeing the kind of ribbing of it, um, corrugation of it, what is that tactility, um, you know, what is the um, kind of visual pattern of it. So it became really odd when, um, <clears throat> you know, that that's my um, wife and Ada's mom, when, you know, we go to document this and it's all about like standing at a distance, right? Sort of looking at this thing, it becomes sort of a passive object. When really like, why when we call it architecture, did that intimacy of when I was making it, why did that disappear? It's like, you know, having, having your grandma knit your, you know, knit your winter gloves um, you know, which is one experience in itself. And then you take those gloves and just sort of pin them on a wall as something to celebrate as opposed to actually wear, right? They were made to be worn. Um, and, and really, to me, that was kind of the idea, like, what if we think about this architecture as being, you know, the same as clothing, you know, um, what happens when the body has a presence within this architecture. So that was a very kind of transformative moment to think like that this architecture, it wants to be active. Um, how do we get it? What, how, do we, how do we make that be an intuitive part of the experience that it is um, active? <clears throat> so it really became this transformation of instead of just being fascinated by the textures on a surface and the sort of structural properties of this system, it was really very much about like all of these things also have this incredibly rich tactile capacity um, in how you touch it and how you move your hand across it. So volumes, instead of just being kind of spatial organization, they become, um, you know, these kind of moments for transformation, right? So I think there's a really kind of, you know, it was a really exciting moment to find this image in our, you know, sort of, pile of images. Um, it takes a moment to figure it out. So that's a child with his arm over his head, wedging himself into the textile. Um, so now you can kind of see like that's his elbow. Here's his head back here. Here's sort of his other shoulder over here. Um, so that kind of like transformation of body and space, um, that exploration, that unknown exploration, um, you know, the architecture now really becomes a canvas for that. I think that, that was, you know, really kind of exciting and valuable way to see it. And then, of course, you know, digging deeper into the sensory system, right, about kind of proprioception, your, your sort of center of gravity in the world, um, and uh, vestibular, how you move through space, um, how, how motion is detected um, when you move through space. <clears throat> So one way that we kind of figured out how to make 
um, the sort of the tactile exploration, the sensory exploration as an intuitional part of the experience. Because again, you put this thing in a gallery, you put this thing in a space on its own, it just by its nature, you know, somebody thinks like, oh, this is just something I'm supposed to walk around and look at. So the main thing, the, the, the key kind of step was thinking about the visual. Um, how can the transformation of the visual um, start to lead into thoughts of, I want to touch this thing, very simply put. Um, so, you know, we started with uh, just kind of, you know, projecting um, colors onto um, the surfaces and then started actually making them interactive. So the objects that are moving around might actually entice you to touch the surface. And again, if you remember that moment from the suitcase, the second there is a positive interaction, the second there is communication between the person, the human, the hand, the elbow, and the surface, there's an immediate uh, response. There's an immediate confirmation that that you've now communicated, it's communicated back. Um, so that kind of immediacy we find like is really important. And, and once we lock in that immediacy, then, then it's just open for business. Right now it's this like amazing sensory landscape um, that children can start to explore. And so this starts to kind of speak to um, the sort of requisite variety um, and the idea that like starting from that yarn is so valuable. So by starting from that yarn, not only are we always creating something new, um, like you don't have the properties of the material until you've made the material. It's kind of this weird um, sort of chicken or the egg or sort of dog chasing its tail. So starting from that fine point where you're making the material specifically for these circumstances and then building all the way up to what are these systems that are essentially like pretty elaborate camping tents. Um, they have these uh, glass fiber beams essentially um, that kind of hold the frame and textile in place. But at the same time, you know, this frame is malleable. So just like the stretchy yarn, just like the surface that that stretchy yarn gets knitted into, just like the volumes that those surfaces get um, uh, uh, expanded into, everything has some level of malleability to it and a very different level of malleability. And again, it's that immediate response. It's that immediate confirmation of communication between human and architecture, between human and space. So my daughter now knows that she has agency over this thing for whatever scale she's going to engage it. So she's really good at trying to destroy things. <laughs> so, you know, she gets to see, can I drag this thing to the ground? Um, but it's going to bounce back. So, you know, there's this reverberation, there's this will to change it, but then there's this reverberation to bounce back, change it, bounce back. So it's always having this kind of feedback um, and then sort of accomplishes this requisite variety by just thinking about that elasticity, that deformability, just across as many material scales as we can um, possibly explore and possibly um, design ourselves. So then Ada gets to do her magic. Um, so now she, you know, says, okay, let's be upside down. Um, <clears throat> let's be submerged within it. Or maybe a face plant is the, the best way to experience it. And this is all within the same, uh, same time at which she um, visited this one particular prototype. So again, it's, you know, and um, so one thing that's really valuable is we have these knitting machines. So if she does mess it up, we can just go make another. Like that was incredibly freeing <laughs> to think about how architecture isn't this pristine thing that humans aren't supposed to try and destroy. Um, <clears throat> And then the other is, it's again, always unpredictable. It's always unknown. It's always contextual. You know, who's with her at this moment? Um, is, you know, is this a communication to me? Is this something just personal to her? I mean, who knows, but it seems to be working. <clears throat> so this was a, a kind of extremely telling moment. This is actually very early on. This was back in like two, 2015, I think one of the very first prototypes that we ever um, developed. Um, and really, you know, it, and what was interesting was just, I mean, it, this almost, what happened in this first moment almost tells the entire story. 
And we've just been trying to kind of um, redo it and expand upon it for the last uh, five years since then. So this was the first time she's seeing this environment. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of creates a little bit of, of a buffer from the crowd around her. Um, as opposed to the visuals, she found this kind of nosedive as being the most exciting way to um, experience the space. But <clears throat> again, think about the suitcase. What's really important with the, the absolutely pivotal moment is here she realizes that she has to communicate with me in order to experience that again. So now, if we think about that graph about um, how we define uh, susceptibility and resilience and who's the orchid, who's the dandelion, I'd argue that we're both orchids at this moment, right? We're both reliant on this architecture. We're both reliant on communicating collectively in some form of language, whether it's seeing her smile, um, whether it's seeing her, you know, lean to me to hug me, which is more just to tell, you know, tell me to pick her up. Um, all these things are coming together at the same time. The environment is a critical medium for that to happen. Um, and it therefore kind of, you know, shifts both of us towards this single point, I would argue, um, on that graph. So Ada is sort of less of an orchid because she's kind of, you know, made resilient um, by the environment. She's resilient to this pretty kind of messy context with all these other people around us. Um, <clears throat> and I am um, more the orchid because environment is key to me being able to communicate with her um, in this moment. So how do we um, start to assess? Oh, hello. Do you want to say hi? Do you want to say hi? Can you, whoa, hold on, can you show everybody your shirt? We found a special shirt to celebrate Liverpool. <laughs> Here, Anna, look, we got you. What's that? What's that? <laughs> hey, you got to open it here. You got to stay here and open it, you silly. <clears throat> you can do it. You don't need my help. There you go. Ooh, what's that book? What's that book? Did we pick the right one? Okay, bye. <laughs> so for her, book is, is very much a part of her, um, her normal environment. Um, I wouldn't really call it a, a kind of like safety blanket um, because it's way more multifunctional than that. Um, and she's also extremely particular. Um, it used to be any book, but now it's a very specific book and she'll kind of wander the house for um, many minutes sometimes trying to find that specific book. So, um, <clears throat> so it kind of like tells the story of, of environment is not just the space around her, but it's also the things under her hand or in her lap. Um, and how that um, helps her um, adjust to maybe, you know, circumstances that aren't as comfortable, <clears throat> aren't often comfortable. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so the way that, um, that I start to address this sort of indeterminacy, indeterminacy of, um, you know, the, the unknowingness of, of what works for Ada, the unknowingness of what works for somebody with a very different perception or very different ways in which they operate in the world. Um, the idea is that design just really doesn't end. Design doesn't end at the moment that we've fabricated and installed something. And you really start to see that, you know, when that child puts his elbow in the surface, when Otto does a nosedive through the structure, those are design action. She's transformed the environment. You know, th those are moments that the function of that environment has meaningfully changed. And it's done so by an author that is not me and an author that is not um, an architect. So I like to try and see it as a sort of like shared authorship as opposed to um, author and user. Um, and that's the way that we can start to, you know, just like continue to understand or continue to unfold, make the um, unknown a bit more known. <clears throat> okay, um, so this is probably my most elaborate slide. <laughs> This is the nexus of, of everything that we do. Um, so this kind of, this is the, the structure of the quote unquote platform 
that we use in order to um, both fabricate and activate these what we call sensory playscape environments. So really on the, the kind of left hand side or the, the, the left hand edge is really sort of the visual component. Um, so how do you, you know, how do you project onto a contour contoured surface? but then also um, sense when somebody's um, uh, touching it and align those two things so that the projection interacts with where the person is touching the surface. Um, we're using like a depth, depth sensor, like a connect to kind of um, identify these things and then a, a custom software um, that we developed, which essentially allows us to apply these interfaces um, to any form that we create. Um, so again, it's, it is much more of an agnostic platform than it is um, project specific. Um, it's mostly developed in Unity, um, so therefore like redesigning the interface is fairly accessible. The, the right-hand side, um, or the right-hand sort of two-thirds, um, are the, the making. Um, so obviously, you know, simulating the tensile form and, and the sort of, um, you know, camping tent uh, beam frame system. Um, working with civil engineers to develop this, this kind of bracketing system, um, how that's related to the structural properties and the kind of bending properties of the geometry that we've designed. Um, and then going through the pretty um, kind of crazy rigor of um, figuring out material properties and translating that into a knit program through which we can um, produce the textiles. Um, just because it's kind of a funny anecdote. The, the NIT program, um, we utilize a, a pixelated bitmap um, where every single pixel, the color of the pixel identifies a certain stitch or machine operation. Um, so as somebody described it, it kind of looks like these sort of um, images from Microsoft Paint, but like, you know, on, on crack magnified by, by a thousand. <laughs> um, so these endlessly huge bitmaps where every single pixel is colored in a very particular way, obviously now done through a series of algorithms. It's not um, painted individually like you might do in Microsoft Paint. So just kind of one example of um, some of the things that we think about. And again, kind of building in this sort of requisite variety in terms of understanding structural properties or even how structure plays out in a kind of um, uh, sensorial way. Um, so the structural system, it, it's this kind of spatial beam. Um, it's built with these polycarbonate brackets. And really for us, the priority is that um, it has to be a really, um, you know, readily constructible system. So one thing when you're not an architect and you're an academic and you're prototyping things, that usually means that somebody will give you a window of like, I don't know, a couple days to a couple weeks maybe to install something and test it out. Um, and then you sort of, you know, take it away and, and you know, um, <clears throat> everybody can go back to business. Um, <clears throat> so what that means is, you know, we have to develop these systems that are incredibly transportable. Um, and like I said, easy, uh, extremely easy to um, assemble. So for instance, this whole frame um, was installed by me alone. Um, within the span of, I think I timed it at around, you know, maybe an hour or so um, between um, all the different elements. And then obviously you have to add the textile into that. But what was a really interesting moment was actually watching this child become fascinated with the elements of that structure. So it, it, the frame has just always been, you know, this thought of like, how do you hold this tensile fabric into the volumes that we want to create? Um, and never really been exactly a point of fascination. So it's really interesting to see this moment that this young child, um, you know, he's just like, it's like he's found the perfect fit, right? Like I can hold on to this frame, but that allows me to kind of wedge myself within this pretty narrow space of a textile um, so that it becomes an active agent, another point of exploration that was, that was actually quite unexpected. Um, <clears throat> and then for him, um, you know, kind of further interrogating the, the sort of tactility of it and even doing exercises with his teacher um, using the textile as kind of a, um, you know, a buffer um, to point out, you know, um, touch your eyes, touch your nose, um, and so on. Um, so with this child, we did kind of want to document like, okay, 
what 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 would requisite variety be um, in this case? Oh wow, I'm going a little bit long, huh? Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'll wrap up soon. Um, <clears throat> so we just wanted to see um, what were all the points of intersection, basically. Um, so if we define the architecture based on a series of regions, um, how many parts of his body did he intersect with those regions? So it's kind of interesting to see the sort of region four in his head. Um, was actually the most active um, spot. So it was this structure and we identified these different parts. Um, and then here looked at it from more of a kinesthetic angle. Um, so we see that one child um, on the bottom, um, he really explored this in a much more um, tactile way. So it's interaction with his body, with his upper body. Whereas this other child, same region, um, he did uh, much more interaction with his lower body, um, looking at it as more of a kind of like um, motor activity as opposed to a tactile um, activity. Um, so <clears throat> um, this is a, a quote from Melanie Yergo about um, autism, which I think is really um, provoking. And again, another author I would highly suggest um, reading. Um, just so happens that both of them are from the University of Michigan, but, um, but their, their work is, is really impressive. Um, so I think, you know, getting in, in, into this understanding of, um, you know, autism in particular and how it's sort of um, perceived societally um, is really, um, you know, challenging for, for how architecture can try to um, address this. Um, so I'm going to maybe, I can definitely step through this quickly. So um, this was always a phrase that I used as the conclusion as sort of the inspiration. Um, but based on, um, you know, what we've just been talking about, actually kind of, um, you know, tried to, to sort of, again, kind of, if this is about inclusion, like, can we please add some more definition and articulate this word a little bit more? So for me, it's really about, you know, someone of uncommon abilities, they really become the author. And if they're the author, then this has to become this sort of socio-material architecture, one that is, you know, inextricably linked between social agents, between individuals, between environments, between technological supports. And then through that, it be, starts to become a medium of language. And of course, that language is going to be indeterminate. We certainly didn't know what it was going to be before we started, and it's going to be incredibly multimodal. It's going to be very multimedia. It's going to be, um, you know, uh, uh, taking all forms. So again, the idea is this then becomes process. So this is really a discussion of process and actually not so not always just about the product, not always just about the physical um, object. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is maybe returning to a bit more of the, the kind of aggressive nature of the original title. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it really is about this challenge of, you know, architecture taking on this otherness, authorship um, suspending itself, you know, can, can, are there architectural processes that can do this? Um, and we definitely, even the conversation I had in my class with my students today, it's great to see them thinking that, you know, yes, we have to be concerned about obviously the materials that we make, um, but we have to just be as, just as critical about the process by which we go that, the, by, by which we do that, the process by which we um, uh, consider architecture as this kind of social medium, um, as, this, as one of the agents as a part of um, um, defining uh, addressing diversity and, and being able to accomplish, um, you know, inclusive spaces. <clears throat> so just as a quick um, uh, last two slides, um, uh, hopefully in this spring, we'll have the opportunity to kind of explore some of these ideas in um, the theater space with a festival that will take place at the Lincoln Center in New York. Um, and then also we'll be exhibiting a new project um, at the Venice Biennale um, it's the first time that they'll have a dedicated children's section, um, so the children actually get to like touch the architecture, which I assume in most cases they're not um, allowed to do. Um, so I, again, want to um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Sorry about running a little bit long, but um, hopefully there's a chance um, to answer some questions as well. 
Well, thank you very much, Sean. I appreciate that. And I hope that the students uh, appreciated the, the breadth of information that you shared um, and a kind of like a sense of empathy that I think um, is so relevant to the culture of architecture now um, and so critical. So Jin Wong has a question, so I'm going to turn it over to him. Um, hi, Sean. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. Your work uh, has really inspired me and really gave me a few questions I should ask myself on my thesis. Uh, my <laughs> thesis is about psychiatry. Um, and um, my two questions are, one, um, I really liked your, um, your idea of giving agency to, um, in my case, would be the patient. But I was thinking also giving agency to the psychiatrist and therefore creating a relationship as a stage between um, the patient being the performer and um, the psychiatrist being an audience, uh, being an audience. But at the same time, um, in that case, um, who, who should have more agency or is it per case scenario? Well, um, I mean, I, I don't want to explicitly say that I don't have the answer to that, but <laughs> I think the one, um, you know, the one thing to consider, of course, um, is, you know, how extensible is the information that I've shared? Um, you know, does it actually give you a, um, a view into what a, a kind of patient doctor relationship is? I don't know, is the kind of child to parent relationship akin to that? I, may, maybe there are moments that, you know, I, I don't know. I'm very careful about, you know, making sure I don't tread into territory that, um, that I haven't uh, kind of revealed through the through the work already. Um, I mean, I think I, I I very much appreciate the way that you're uh, looking at it. So I think you're heading in the right direction for sure. And and I'm glad you picked up on that word um, agency because I think that's probably um, you know the the key thing that the that the patient loses. I mean, I mean, I guess if anything, you know, I I'd, I'd really suggest. Uh, reading the Tobin Siebers um, book, if you haven't uh, uh, seen it yet. Um, he talks about the, uh, the, the kind of medical model or sort of ableism where um, disability is often addressed by that sort of deficit perspective that I talked about, um, meaning that the effort is to try and fix that deficit to bring it back to some sort of normalcy. Um, so, you know, does the patient doctor relationship work along those lines? I mean, it's in an obviously different context because you are seeking out help to try and fix something potentially, but, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe somewhere in there, I think definitely considering about agency, you know, what is the relationship between these, these two people and, um, you know, how does this maybe over medicalized view of um, problem versus, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say personality, um, but uh, maybe individualism, I guess. Um, you know, how does that get um, miscalculated or misweighted, I guess? Thank you for that. Um, my second question, if I can ask that, um, is, um, and um, I understand that you're, um, um, I feel like more, your approach is very much um, in line with um, the gestalt therapy method and the play, th me play therapy method. Um, in your um, advice, um, what would you, what, would, what advice would you give to um, architecture students who um, want to create an architecture based on one type or many multi types of therapy? Um, and is there anything we should be concerned about um, in doing so? <laughs> So I'd say the biggest concern is how do you know what therapy is the most appropriate? Um, I'm always, you know, I, I, I talk with a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, kind of reach out to me and, and um, you know, they're, they're maybe architects doing work and, and they um, have an idea about how they want to design a playground um, or there's a group that, you know, has a, um, has a particular strategy for how to create inclusive playgrounds. I'm always very skeptical of those moments because if you're convinced that you have a, um, a kind of singular uh, solution 
I'm convinced that it's likely you're wrong. <laughs> um, so, so again, you know, for me, it's it's very much about you know that that agency, that that kind of um, persistent unknowingness. How do you design something that is able to be discovered by somebody else? An answer is able to be discovered by somebody else. Um, and if you've constrained it already to a certain therapeutic pr approach, then you've most likely um, lost some of the capacity to, to reach a, a wider audience. Um, so that's where, where I think um, it becomes kind of dangerous to, to just become convinced by one therapeutic approach um, or another. Thank you. We have one last question from Ching, and then we'll close out our lecture tonight. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Super interesting lecture. Um, it seems like um, just kind of following along with your idea of like this design being like really open ended or like kind of unfinished process that left, you know, like whatever possible uh, way for people to manipulate with it after. Um, it seems like the social interactions or the bodily experience that are generated by your daughter or other people are taken into consideration into this kind of like feedback loop in order to kind of improve on to your prototype um, using the computational tool that you show in the presentation. So I wonder like how you also left some sort of like ambiguity to the way that people can play with it because the digital tool or the way you describe it right now seems like very precise, I think. <laughs> it's a, yeah, I mean, that was again, a part of a discussion with my students today, kind of how do you, deal with precision versus indeterminacy or um, unpredictability. Um, I guess I like to look at precision a bit more um, as exhaustiveness. Um, so the fact that, you know, we design these things literally to like the nth degree, that means that each level of the design, we can consider um, a, a set of qualities um, to which somebody might access or become, um, you know, fascinated or interested in. So the more layers that we can put in there, then the more um, moments there are for somebody to, um, you know, kind of gain interest and, and become, you know, make it their own, transform it in a way that, that they feel um, is most um, suitable. Um, I mean, we've done a few things to kind of uh, test out um, how malleable or abstract um, the, the prototypes are. Um, one was just more of a fun game where, you know, we, we just told kids um, after they played with it for five or 10 minutes, like go right up on the board or have your parents write up on the board, um, you know, give the project a name. Um, and it was interesting to see, you know, some, some, you know, called it the fish tank because there were fish projected on it. Somebody called it like a dinosaur skull and you're like, yeah, okay, I kind of see that. And then there were just like a whole huge list of, of really oddball ones um, as well. And it was, so it was kind of really the oddball ones was the longest list um, as opposed to ones that kind of fit into the category. Um, what we do find, I mean, it's, it's really challenging um, to quantify these things um, because just the context means so much. Um, so we've set up a prototype in a small room once at a children's center. And when we did that, we saw a lot more inquisitive behavior. So we saw a lot, a wider array, array of uses, um, you know, occupying different spaces of the environment. Um, you know, interacting with the visuals or climbing through the tubes or, you know, laying into the structure or, you know, uh, things like that. Um, when we took a, we designed a, a bigger prototype and we put it out in the floor of the, um, of the children's museum. And um, I mean, they, they just really saw it as like a jungle gym. Um, and it really wasn't explored in, um, you know, the more kind of intricate tactile ways. It was explored of like, okay, how the hell do I climb across this thing and get from one side to the other? Um, and it really got quite destroyed because we didn't expect that level of physical activity. Um, but it, it really, it really rode a very narrow line of, of how people um, were using it and were kind of 
you know, a little upset, but also kind of, you know, fascinated by why it was, um, why it was so different. Um, so, you know, I think, um, you know, again, kind of creating materials, sort of unknown materials, creating materials for ourselves for specific application. I think that um, actually allows us to create a, a level of abstraction, a level of, you know, I haven't seen this before, um, sort of nature. Um, but then, you know, we're kind of at the moment where we're now trying to start to figure out ways that we can actually um, kind of measure um, some of those uh, properties um, of the environments that we make. So it's kind of a, a very um, poignant question in the sense that we've sort of gotten to the point of creating these really robust environments and now we want to figure out how do we measure their actual, you know, effects and value. Um, on behavior, whether it's, you know, in, in the realm of diversity or for more neurotypical audience. Okay, I lied before. One last question from Kyle Miller. <laughs> thanks, Amber. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Sean. Really beautiful work and um, <laughs> particularly appreciate the level of sophistication that goes into the material research and development. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, I think I have a reasonable question to ask. When I see the work, <laughs> let's, let's say at surface value, I'm reminded of other projects that might share a similar aesthetic sensibility just in terms of um, single surface development, some of the mm -hmm. aesthetic qualities of the project. So, you know, I'm reminded of some of Al Alvin Huang's work, the, the charging station. I'm, th I'm thinking of Jenny Sabin's work. I'm thinking of the lava, yeah. green, lime green lobby. Sure. And so, you know, <laughs> right, right. There, there's a, there, it certainly fits into that realm of a kind of aesthetic predilection mm -hmm. or sensibility. In this case, I think there's an, and it's related to the answer you just gave. I think there's, you could make an argument for its appropriateness given the way in which people physically engage it and the abstract nature of it. Um, but I'm wondering like how, how much of, let's say, does the aesthetic uh, presentation of it really sync up with the ambitions you have regarding inclusivity and engagement and sensorial environments? Are, are those things to you incredibly entangled or do you imagine that there are slightly different pursuits running parallel that intersect from time to time? I, I, I absolutely think you're correct that in, in the sense that, um, you know, uh, tensile knitted structures are not the only answer. <laughs> um, so, it, so in that sense, yeah, I think there's a certain kind of parallelism to it in terms of what the pursuits are. Um, so, and, and maybe the way to best explain it is, I think there's potentially two branches to understand the value of, let's say, a sensorial experience. Um, so, I mean, obviously our lives are sensorial experience. I mean, through my daughter, it's a little bit more magnified. So that's why I speak to it that specifically, but it isn't, it isn't just a realm of diversity doesn't mean deal with sensor, sensor, sensorality. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> right. I mean, I mean, we all, you know, navigate the world because of our sensory system. Um, so I think it's a, a critical component in that. I think it's just something that often isn't offered enough agency or enough variability to suit a wider audience. Um, <clears throat> so in that context of, of um, addressing kind of sensorial agency, let's say, um, I think there's sort of two channels um, that we're trying to understand. So one, in these particular environments that we're creating, um, is that the moment that is necessary to um, accomplish the challenges of creating this kind of shared social language, right? Do you have to be immersed within this rich, um, agential, malleable, transformable environment in order to facilitate the development of some sort of, you know, new form of communication? So I think that that's one question. Um, then the other channel is maybe there are key moments of agency, whatever they might be, that instills a sense of confidence is kind of a simple version of it, but let's just say instills a sense of confidence that actually allows you to better uh, navigate what is a more normative condition. So does it have to happen within the environment or is there something in that moment that allows you to, to 
to take on the larger environment. And um, personally, I think I think the latter is the more extensible environment is the more extensible argument. Um, you know, it isn't about like, oh, every space needs a playscape in it, right? <laughs> um, I think to me, it's it's more about like what what are the key um, what are the key facets of some of these key underlying facets of some of these architectural conditions that do maybe need to cons be considered at moments in a larger normative um, um, environment um, that would facilitate some of the kind of inclusivity um, that we've seen um, in, in, in some of the um, tests of the environments um, that, that we've done. Does that kind of, um, does, that, does that sort of get to your, to it your does, question? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Great. Well, I want to say thank you, Sean. I really appreciate uh, the work that you shared. I think you presented in a, in a, a pretty vulnerable, but also progressive way. <laughs> um, that's most appreciated. Um, and thank you to our students who asked questions. And um, we hope you have a wonderful evening, even this is, though it's a kind of unprecedented virtual lecturing season. So <laughs> have another one. Super. All right. Thanks, John. Awesome. Thanks, All right. John. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <clears throat>